hope you hear me well. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first conference after this COVID confinement, and I'm very pleased to be in this wonderful place. So I changed the title of my talk because suddenly I realized I'm in Poland and it's the land of Sierpinski or Sierpinski. I'm trying to learn the Polish pronunciation. The first was better. So I decided to talk about that. Um, oops, why oh, it's not moving. The talk is about quantum simulators and this community knows because with cold atoms, it has been the first time when we started developing the ideas of Feynman about using uh, an artificial system that is engineered in order to simulate some model or some other problem that we would like to understand. And after the development of quantum simulators with cold atoms, it started to be developed also with photonic systems. And the first part of my talk, I will tell you a little bit about what we have been doing using electrons, how to perform quantum simulations with electronic systems. And the platform that we are going to use are surface states of metals like copper 111 plus the STM plus adsorbates like carbon monoxide, hundreds of them, that we are going to manipulate on top of the surface using the STM. In the second part of my talk, I will tell you about photonic systems. And in the third part, I will give you a glimpse of a, a last work we did, which is just theoretical. Okay, so this... Uh, type of simulators started actually in 1993 with the work in the group of Don Eigler in Almaden, when he took the surface of copper 111, it's basically like a two dimensional electron gas, and he was patterning this, oops, sorry, he was patterning a quantum corral. So here you see these spikes are the separation between the, the, the iron atoms, it's in the nanometer scale, and these beautiful waves that you see here are the electronic waves. So it's modulus of the wave function is square, and it has this interference pattern like water waves would be in a real corral, and this is the so-called first quantum corral. So this is like confining the atoms into a parabolic trap, if you want, in two dimensions for the cold atoms community. But it took until 2012, when Hari Manoharan decided to take these atoms, these adatoms, these carbon monoxide adatoms in this case, the black spots, and using the needle, the SGM like a needle to push them around, he was patterning this triangular structure with these barriers, they are like little mountains. And then the electrons are forced to go around and the electrons form these beautiful honeycomb latches that he called molecular graphene. So this is now like graphene, but on a length scale that is 10 times larger than the real graphene. The real graphene is on the angstrom scale, this one is in the nanometer scale. And it has the advantage of being completely perfect, okay? And you can introduce disorder, you can introduce defects, and you can completely manipulate it at will. So, looks like my connection is unstable. Okay, so we have been then uh, doing many things in this direction. Oh my gosh, why it doesn't go well? Yeah, here. So we have been working a lot. Uh, my group is doing the, exper the, the theoretical calculations. We build the design. What is this? <clears throat> what is happening? Did you do something here? Zoom meeting. OK. Let me close this. What is happening? Your internet connection is unstable. What can I do here? Maybe if you can unlock, uh, uh, disconnect from the internet, I would appreciate. Is it okay? <clears throat> okay. 
So my thing here is back. Should the what? I should get back and share the screen again. Make this bigger. Share screen. Share. Okay. We are back. Good. Uh, if you can just close this this window. Yeah, looks good again. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, so uh, we have been working a lot with this platform, trying to push forward this type of uh, quantum simulators with electrons. So the first thing we did in 2017, it was to build a lib lattice to show that you can use this triangular underlying potential also to build square lattices. Then we have shown how to control orbital degrees of freedom. In this lib lattice, we could put S orbitals in a certain site, Px orbitals in another site, Py orbitals in another site, and control them into energy and real space with a, a full control of that. That's the second work. Then we have been trying to build topological systems. We built the first HOTI, a higher order topological insulator with electrons by building a topological Kagome lattice. We have been investigating also what's the fate of edge states in this type of uh, um, lattice uh, protected systems. And we have been recently also generating P bands with, uh, which are flat, because there is a huge interest in, in flat bands. But what I'm going to tell you today, I will concentrate on fractals. So in 2019, we have been building what is called the first quantum fractal. So this uh, was built on the electronic platform to show that the electronic wave functions are perceiving the fractal dimension and living in a dimension 158. Uh, last year, this work was taken for the highlights of the 15 years of the nature physics. But now, very recently, a month ago, it was published, we went a step beyond, and we could now study transport by using a photonic system. So that's what I'm going to tell you today, how is the dynamics in a quantum fractal. And at the very end, I would like to tell you about a theoretical work. It was done by Robin Fairstrat, and it's a master's student who just now, 15 minutes ago, won the best, the best thesis prize in the science faculty in Utrecht University. This is about fractals in the free energy landscape. I would like to tell you about our time glasses, at least to give you a taste about it. Okay, fractals, what is that? Fractals are intrinsically connected to humankind and nature. You find them in cauliflowers, in the roots of the trees, in the branches of the trees, in the structure of the leaves, but we also find them inside our body. For instance, in our circulatory system, in our lungs, but also in our neurons. And this is something very interesting because more than 20 years ago, Roger Penrose, together with, with the anesthesiologist Stuart Hameroff, they were proposing that actually the structure of the neurons ends up with microtubules, which are a fractal. And Penrose was proposing that the, 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 when we become conscious of something, it should be because of a quantum process in this fractal, in these tubular neurons. And this theory, which is called an OR theory, orchestrated objective reduction, had many adepts and many people opposing it. And they have been fighting and trying to prove and doing experiments for more than 20 years. And now I think that with our quantum simulators, we have been measuring something that we can say, okay, go back and measure the brain. And if it's the same, it is a quantum process, okay? There are also fractals in our body that are dynamical. If you look at our heart beating dynamics, it's neither periodic nor random. It's a fractal, and it should be, because you were ill in either case, if it becomes periodic or uh, random. 
fractals are also very important for technology. If you do, for instance, solar cells, and you cover the surface with a fractal structure, higher the complexity of your fractal, more energy you can store. They are also very interesting for building antennas because then you can send and receive short and large frequencies simultaneously because this system has much richness. They are very frequent in art because our eyes perceive as beautiful everything which has fractal dimensions connected to nature that's very fractal. So you see here a Sierpinski triangle from the 11th century after Christ in a church in Rome. You see a drawing by Escher that has been using so many fractals, and also Pollock, who was getting a fractal structure by pouring colors and dancing over the, the, the paintings. So one of the properties of a fractal, for the ones who don't know, is the, the property of self-similarity. You keep zooming on it and you keep seeing the same structure. One very simple fractal that we could build is the Sierpinski fractal. You take a triangle, you cut an inverted triangle in the center, that's the first generation. You remain with three equal triangles in which of them you cut another one and you go on forever. Mathematically, the fractal would be reached only in the infinite limit, but we are going to talk about physical fractals, which are finite. Fractals have something that's called the Hausdorff dimension that is no integer. The Hausdorff dimension is given by the log of the number divided by the log of the scaling. How does this come about? Let me explain you that. Suppose you have a one dimensional line and now you scale it by a factor two. Here is your scaling factor. Now you ask how many of the original ones you can fit inside. The number is two because you are in one dimension. If you take the red square now, you scale it by two in the x and the y directions, and you ask, this is the scaling factor here, how many of the red ones you can fit, the number is four, you are in two dimensions. Take now a red triangle, completely red, scale it by two in this direction and in this direction, paint this one completely blue, Ask yourself how many of the red triangles you can fit inside. One, two, three, four. It would be four. You would be in two dimensions. But you have a Sierpinski triangle. So you cut the central one and you get only three. And log three over log two gives you 158. So you basically go into this fractional dimension or fractal dimension because you have voids, because there are parts that are missing in your structure. Okay? Fractals also appear in the quantum world. There are some that you know, the Hofstadter butterfly for the energy levels as a function of the flux piercing each plaquette in a lattice, or the Anderson localization, or in quantum turbulence. But those are not fractals in real space, as we are interested. So our first step was to build a Sierpinski fractal. We built three generations, n equal one, n equal two, n equal three. Here on the right, you see each of these brown spots, black spots, is one carbon monoxide atom, which is the barrier confining the electrons and preventing them to escape from the structure or to prevent them from going there. And then the electrons will go around these barriers. We had first, second, and third generation. We describe the system in two ways, one in the continuum, uh, solving Schrodinger equation with the, 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 the barrier potentials and one using some kind of tight bind model. You will tell me there is no regularity, there is no periodicity. What are you talking about the tight binding model and how are you going to solve? You can either solve it for a finite size structure with labeled sites, or there is a way to treat the system. You just, that was proposed by Kadanoff, you duplicate the system and you impose periodic boundary conditions, and then you can have quasi Brillouin zones. Okay, what we have found at that point was that uh, this white part that I'm plotting here, which is the projection of the modulus of psi square, and we could then apply what is called a minkowski bulligand method or box counting method to this modulus of the wave function is square and to find that when we were plotting the log of the number so this means covering the surface with the circles and counting how many circles you need 
to cover the surface, and the log of the number versus the log of the inverse radius was having a straight slope, and the slope of this curve gives me the fractal dimension, and we were finding to be 159 and around, always around 1.6. So that was to say that the, the quantum uh, uh, object, which is the wave function representing the electron, is perceiving the fractal dimension. Okay? But those were static fractals. With the STM, I cannot study dynamics. And now I would like to understand how is the transport, quantum transport, in a fractal. So that's what uh, I went on to study together with the group of Shanmin Jin at Shanghai Jiao Tong University in China. So uh, this work has been mostly performed by Xiao Yongshu. And the question that we want to address here is how would a quantum ant move in a labyrinth? Because uh, De Jean has been studying the classical problem that he called the ant in the labyrinth to look at the diffusion of a classical particle in a fractal. And now we have a quantum ant. What should happen here? It was published very recently, this work. So the way how we're going to, to build this fractal, you can see here on the right, this is a chip. And using this laser writing techniques, you will build these wave guides. And the cross section of these wave guides will be the shape of a Sierpinski triangle or a, a Sierpinski gasket, a, a Sierpinski um, carpet, or a dual Sierpinski carpet. I will show you the images, OK? And then you inject a photon on the top side. You, the photon will traverse, tra will propagate along the waveguide with a speed of light. So by building many of these structures, hundreds with the different lengths, you know when it comes out here. So you know the time. And at the same time, you take an image because by quantum tunneling, it propagates in the cross section direction, which is the, the, where the fractal is. Okay, so you make hundreds of these structures where this uh, uh, penetrating direction here will have different lengths and you measure all that. And the question is, uh, this is a continuous time quantum walk and uh, we are going to see how the wave function is propagating and this is described by the state binding on a lattice. You do a finite size calculation for that into the uh, Sierpinski triangle. We are going also to study two other types of fractals. One is the Sierpinski carpet, so that is a square. You divide into nine little squares and you cut the central one. Each of them you divide into nine and cut the central one. And this structure has a dimension 189, okay? Log eight over log three. And we are going also to study the dual Sierpinski carpet which is now where you put lattice sites where before you had a field square. The reason to study the dual Sierpinski carpet is because it has the same fractal dimension as the Sierpinski carpet, but the position of the voids is different. So we want to study both the influence of the different geometry and with the same fractal dimension. Okay, so here you see now the experiment, how light is spreading through this Sierpinski gasket when it is injected on the top corner. And now you can measure the variance, the sigma squared as a function of time. And here I am plotting the variance on a log scale versus time or propagation length along the tube. And as you can see, you would expect for a usual system, if you would be injecting in the center, you would expect that the beginning is ballistic. It should be going with a T square. But here, because I'm injecting from the boundaries, it doesn't go with a Z square, but with a Z to 2.5. That's because of the position where I am injecting. But then it, you, you usually would go into diffusive behavior going linearly in T. But here, what you see that there is a regime when it is going with Z to 1.58 which is the fractal dimension, and then it saturates, okay? But what is very beautiful in this experiment, we can know how the wave functions, how is the configuration of the wave function in the entire Sierpinski triangle, 
at this moment when it has changed the regime from the 2.5 to the 158 in the exponent. And what you can see is, as you could guess, it starts diffusing as if it would be a full triangle, and it goes with 2.5. In the moment when the photons meet the first hole, it knows it's not a full triangle. So it starts changing. And what is very nice is that this regime, so you see here the 3.875, it changed when the photons have met the first hole. You see here the, the, the configuration 2.675 millimeters. And then the photons go around, they touch the hole. When they can go on again, they understood the hole. They already know the fractal dimension of the entire structure. Isn't it magic? They meet the hole, they are stuck. They know they can't go on propagating with the 2.5. They go around and now they know it is a Sierpinski triangle. I find it magic. And they stay then with that dimension until they have explored the entire triangle and then they saturate. Okay, so this, uh, we can now check how it would be the propagation in a full Sierpinski when you are uh, in a full triangle, a field triangle, it would be Z to 2.5 because of the, the boundaries. And we can then understand all that. So it's very nice to see the difference between the, the regular triangle and the, the, the Sierpinski gasket. Now, we can also calculate something called the polia number, which is connected to the probability to return to the first site. And very interestingly, you see that there are plateaus when I plot the polia number as a function of the propagation length, precisely at the point where I am entering into the fractal dimension. Okay, so this is another signature of a quantum transport. If it would be a triangle, it would be just a completely smooth curve. Now we go to the Sierpinski carpet, and again, we see precisely the same feature. So at the moment, it starts propagating. Now the exponent here is 2.4, because in a square, the, the, the exponent in a complete square would be 2.4. But precisely when it touches the, 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 the hole, it starts changing, and when it knows that what is the configuration of the hole, it picks up 1.89 which is the dimension of the Sierpinski carpet. Underneath, I show you always the simulation because we also did simulations, okay? And you can see precisely the moment when it has explored the entire hole to know its fractal dimension. Uh, we can also compare how it would be with the full square and we can understand that this 2.4 exponent is correct for the entire square. And again, we can look at the polia number and see the same steps in quantum transport that it's a signature of the fractality. Now we go to the dual Sierpinski carpet, where you meet a hole from the very first site. What should change? What changes is that I start diffusing with the exponent 1.89 from the very beginning, because it sees the hole from the very beginning. Okay, so it starts already, in this case, from the fractal regime and the rest of the features are the same. Okay, so my partial conclusions here is that by looking at quantum transport in three fractals based on continuous time quantum walks, we could observe the evolution patterns, we could see signatures of plateaus in the polia number for the, the when studying the, the variance and the polia number, and we see that this diffusion is anomalous, it's propagating with the fractal dimension Sigma square is going to the time to the exponent, which is my fractal dimension. Okay? And the voids are very important because they decide when you start seeing this fractal dimension. Okay, so I finished my second part. Oops, let me know. Yes, that's perfect. I can give you a glimpse at this last work that we have been doing, and we have been then proposing or finding a system where one could realize a novel state of matter, which would be a time glass. And we did that by using something that maybe some of you never heard about, which is a fractional calculus approach. 
So it was uh, published recently, and this is Robin who just got his master thesis prize. I'm very proud of him. And Ozella was co-supervising his, his thesis. Ozella is a PhD student. So let me give you an idea about that. So what are glasses? Glasses are states which are trapped, uh, 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 structures which are trapped into a metastable state. So they are neither solid nor liquid. They look like solid, but on a long time scale, they are flowing because they would be trapped in a, in a local minimum like here, right? So the, the, in addition to the normal glass, there is a very beautiful phase that has been proposed by Elizabeth Gardner. This is a brilliant physicist who unfortunately passed away very, very early in life. And she proposed the phase that's nowadays called a Gardner phase. And the Gardner phase consists of a fractal structure in the energy landscape. So basically, you have here your energy landscape, which has a certain minimum in violet. And then inside of this minimum, you have several minima, which are the orange ones. Inside the orange ones, you have several minima, which are the green ones. So there is caging inside, like the, the Russian dolls, one inside another. Okay, and this Gardner phase is an anomalous glass that was proposed by her when he's studying uh, spin glasses, but now people are starting to realize it experimentally in different systems. So basically, if you look at the mean square displacement in a liquid, you would go from uh, the, the ballistic into the diffusive regime, which is linear in T. In a normal glass, you would go from the ballistic to a saturation, you would get a plateau. And for the marginal glass, you should see a series of plateaus. Okay? Ad infinitum. Okay, so this is a review paper from the group of Giorgio Parisi and the French group in Paris. So what we have been doing, these things are usually described in a mean field using the Langevin equation you look at one particle embedded in a uh, diffusive environment provided by all the others. So what we decided to study is the so-called fractional Langevin equation. And fractional, because this derivative, usually the Langevin equation is mass times acceleration plus eta times velocity, where you have the first derivative of position. We are now going to study the s derivative of position where s can be any number and we will concentrate here on the case where s is between zero and one i have a fractional derivative and this is a force is the fluctuating force it has zero average and white noise a delta function correlated noise okay so the process now becomes no markovian s is a new parameter but the interesting thing is we were able to find an analytical solution for this problem for a generic S between zero and one. We are in the subomic regime. The, the solution is given in terms of meta Gleffler functions. And if I uh, calculate now the mean square displacement, I can have the asymptotic behavior for small temp times and for long times. And let me show you now the plots that you can get. So basically, by varying the exponent in the derivative, I can describe all phases within the same framework. That's the beauty of this approach. If S is 1, I am describing a liquid. I am going from the ballistic into diffusive. If S is 0 0.49, 0 0.5 is a, a log behavior, but let's say 0 0.49, you have a glass. You go from ballistic and you saturate. If S is zero, you have the Gardner phase. You start having an infinite number of plateaus with an asymptotic linear in T behavior. But if S is between zero and 0 0.1, you have many plateaus and then you saturate. And this is the novel phase that we discovered. And this is a time glass. Basically, what happens is that if you look now, there is between zero and 0 0.1, there is a universal regime here for T, and then you see all these uh, uh, plateaus here. This is an oscillation in time. And in a, in a linear scale, you see that these plateaus have a constant width. 
yes, I'm finishing. And you can then uh, find out this periodicity, this periodicity is pi ts. We could connect this to a microscopic description in the framework of the calderon leggett model and show how to microscopically derive a fractional derivative equation, Langevin equation, with white noise. So basically, this is uh, what I wanted to say for this part. We have a new regime between 0 and 0 0.5, where we have anomalous diffusion, but we finally converge to a glass phase with an emergent periodicity, and we propose the novel state of matter, which is a time glass. So to conclude, I have been telling you how to build fractals in real space for electrons and how the wave function of the electrons could perceive that they are living in dimension 158. We did this using quantum electronic quantum simulators with the STM. Then I have been showing you using a, a, a photonic experiment, how is the quantum transport in fractals and how they differ from the, 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 the classical ones. Then we looked at fractals in energy space, in the free energy space, uh, and we found this time glass. I didn't tell you, but we have been also working on fractals in the Hilbert space. If you have a quasi-crystal, your wave functions form a fractal in Hilbert space, and then you can use this to study disorder, for instance, and quantum hole effect in fractals. I show you uh, my senior collaborators, Ingmar Svart, who did the experiments for the electrons, Xian Mingjin has the lab uh, for the, the photonics, and Danielle is also in Utrecht with Ingmar. This is a website to the connection between consciousness and diffusion in a fractal. And I would like to thank the, the PhD and master students who did the work. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So maybe Maciek, I think, was the fastest as usual. Very slow. Um, so I'm a little puzzled about this super diffusion, actually. Yes. So um, suppose that I have a full uh, square. I yes. start in the middle, so I yes. should start ballistic. You get two. I get two. Yes. After some time, if the square is very large, I get one because it's mm -hmm. a normal diffusion. Exactly. Then I hit maybe not the corner, but just the wall. Yes. And then I again change the exponent to two point yes. something yes. because I have restricted exactly. space. So I have no place exactly. to diffuse normally. Exactly. Yes? This will be the yes. case. Exactly. So we checked for the triangle or for the square. If you inject from the middle, you would get two as you expect. Okay. The problem is that when you inject from the corner, the corner you, has the boundaries. And, obvious, yeah. and that's why you get so 2.5. Exactly. So 2.5 or 2.4. But 2. what 4. are the time scale that govern these crossovers? Uh, the time scale, the crossover you mean into the fractal regime? No, no, no. I forget about fractal. We are in a full yes, thing. Just yes, let me yes. understand the simplest thing. I'm yes. too stupid. I start in the middle, yes. I go ballistically for some time, and yes. then normal diffusion. What uh -huh. is the time scale? I hit the wall, I change again for some time the, the, the exponent. What are the time scales if the uh, rate is constant? Okay. Yes, so uh, usually you become diffusive when you are at larger time scale compared to the microscopic of your system, right? That is also for the Langevin case, for instance. You need times much longer than the little kicks that you are. You could think that you have many particles, okay? The short time scales is before you are feeling the, the diffusion, before you are getting kicked. So for very short length scales, you feel free. So is ballistic. Yes, exactly. Yes, that would be it. Yes, that would be it. Yes. Okay, we have we have another question on online. So Pedro Magnani, can you unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? Ah, yes. Uh, yes, oh, yes, yes, thank you. We have yes. Pedro. Can, can you hear yes, me? Yes, we hear you, please. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, first, thanks for the great talk, Professor. And the question that I have is about the first part of your presentation. Uh, I would like to know why does the variance on the simple surface skin carpet uh does not saturate 
while in the double carpet and on the triangle, it seems to happen. The saturation yes, seems to happen. Thank happens. you very much. Very important question, Pedro. So the reason is because we couldn't go long enough. You see, there are more than 200 sites here. The system is extremely big. And to be able to see the saturation, you have to let it, it go up to the point that it, it explores the entire square and then it saturates. It only saturates when it comes to the end. And we couldn't build so many for that because this structure was too large. If you look at the size of the triangle and of the dual uh, Sierpinski carpet, they are smaller. And then you reach the regime, you can see here that the, the moment when it saturates is precisely the moment when you have reached the, the I had a figure somewhere. You see uh, here at 9275, you see that the light, if you look at it very, very well, you see that the light has explored the entire triangle and then it saturates. But for the Sierpinski carpet, we couldn't get to this point. It, it was, it's just a technical thing. If you would do more, you would see the same. I see, so it's okay. a experimental limitation. Exactly, no. yes, it would be too costly to get there because the, 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 the size we decided to investigate was too large. I see, okay. okay. So thank we have you. another thank question you here. Yes, you're very welcome. Thanks for Hi. the question. So thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have actually three questions, but are quite compact. So because you were mentioning underserved localization. Yes. And uh, the, dim the dimensionality of the system is very important to see underserved localization yes. because in 1D are all localized in 3D. Uh, Yes. Would be the same uh, physics uh, related uh, to fractal. So fractal in 1D, 2D, 3D will show some different behavior. First question. Second, this is single particle physics. Yes. Uh, then of course, uh, since uh, come to a, to a world in which I can add interaction. Yes. What happen if I could think to add interaction in this system? And then the third question is related to the last part. Uh, what happen if I have a, a very nice fractal and I start to remove part of the fractal, yes. so to add some disorder yes. when yes. the system starts to have yes. a transition. Thank you. Yeah. These are all great, great questions. Let me start by the last one. That was also a question I had myself, because if after touching the first hole, the photons already know the fractal dimension, I was thinking, but how in the hell does it know? Let's displace this hole a little bit, take a carpet, a carpet and instead of putting the hole in the right position, you displace it. Is it going to know? It does know. We did the, the simulations, we didn't do the experiment, but the, the, the simulations always give the same as the experiments. And it doesn't pick up the fractal dimension anymore. It knows that the hole is in the wrong position. It is amazing. We have been playing also with injecting photos from different positions than the corner from the middle, and everything was confirmed. Yes, so it knows. It knows if it is a, a, a regular fractal structure or not. I want to investigate this further. That's my next work, is role of disorder in fractals. Uh, the second question was, ah, interactions. Yes, we didn't study interactions here yet, but it's going to be fascinating, right? Because I have no idea what can come. We are in a completely new dimension, so it will be great to study interactions in a fractal. Maybe with cold atoms you could do. And the first question is, here it seems like for quantum transport or for the wave function that the dimension doesn't matter much. For the, 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 the Anderson localization, yes, it does, because it's about localization, right? And localization properties are very different in one dimension and in two dimensions. But here in between, if you are between one and two or between two and three, it doesn't seem to matter much. It would matter, for instance, you could ask questions for Bose-Einstein condensation, which is only at zero temperature in two dimensions, and it's at finite temperatures in three dimensions. And what happens in between? Can I get a finite temperature B, C at 2.1 dimensions, right? That is uh, an interesting question. That was also my question concerning topology because topology has been classified for integer dimensions. And you know, you have a, a quantum hole in 2G, but not in 3G. And what about the 2.3 dimensions? Do I get quantum hole or not? Does it disappear instantaneously? 
And the answer is that we got now, theoretically, it's no universal. So there is a lot to be explored uh, in between. Okay. So thanks a lot. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Yes, so let's thank Christian again. Thank you. That was wonderful.